one to this week, this week's session of Leading Edge Fellow Talks. I am Mohini Sengupta, and together with Dr. Julie Ellie, we're very happy to host the third and almost last session on neuroscience. As you know, there will be one more NeuroTalk next Wednesday. And today, we have four outstanding speakers who push the boundaries of our knowledge on how we sense the environment and make use of that information. We will hear from Anna, Supraja, and Elise on workings of the visual system, and then Rose will tell us about the sense of touch. So without any further ado, let's get started with our first speaker. I should tell you that all the talks are 12 minutes. Questions can be posted on the chat that I can then ask, or if you want to raise your hand, you can ask the questions yourself after the talk. All right, so our first speaker today is Dr. Anna Vlasitz. Anna began her scientific career at UC Berkeley in Marla Feller's lab, and then did a postdoc in Thomas Euler's lab at the University of Tübingen in Germany. Now she is at Northwestern University where she's doing a postdoc in Tiffany Schmidt's lab, working on linking function of the retina to behavior in the context of neurodevelopmental disorders. Today, Anna will be speak speaking about her work in the Euler Lab. And in addition to the Leading Edge Fellowship, Dr. Vlasitz has won several awards like the L'Oreal UNESCO Prize for Women in Science, Grass Foundation Achievement Award, and the Christian Nuslin Wolhard Foundation Fellowship. She is on the hunt for a faculty position this year. So without any further delay, let's here, Anna. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'll just share my screen here. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So, hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be starting off this session of the Leading Edge uh, Symposium. And today I'm going to be talking about. Um, uh, visual information divergence in populations of retinal interneurons. I like to show this photo that I took at the Tübingen Botanic Garden because I think it illustrates two different visual modalities uh, that I'm going to be speaking to you about today. Um, it's probably very difficult for you to spot the subject of this photo. But it was very easy for me to see at the time because this bee was moving and because I used color vision. So today I'm going to be talking about how the mammalian retina processes motion and color information. So vision starts with the eye where light from the environment is focused by the lens onto this neural tissue called the retina. And that light is detected by photoreceptors in the retina, which send visual information through a neural circuit and then onward through the optic nerve and to the brain, where that information can then be used for uh, experiencing the world and for behavior. Now, one thing that you might notice about this neural circuit is that it looks a little bit complicated. And if you take anything away from this talk, I hope that you'll take away that the retina is not simply a camera taking a video of the world um, for the brain to use, but it's doing a huge amount of processing and compression. To really illustrate this, I wanna first point out that this neural circuit here is actually a huge simplification of the retina. Here you can see a schematic of most of, of the diversity of cell types in the retina. Um, and this is in the mouse. And you can see that this diversity of types is sort of growing as we go from the starting point of retinal processing the photoreceptors onto the 14 bipolar cell types and then to the over 60 amacrine cells and, over and around 32 ganglion cell types that are then the ones having their axons go out and go into the brain. And these cell types are all tiling the retina and sampling the same visual space. And this complexity is thought to be important for extracting different visual features from the scene, like motion and color. 
and sending those different visual features to the brain for processing in different brain regions. But for many of these cells, including almost all of these green amacrine cells, we have no idea what role they're playing in this processing. So how can we start to get a handle on what each of these cell types is doing for vision? During my PhD, I pursued understanding one specific cell type in the retina, the starburst amacrine cell. And I drilled into the details of how this single cell type works using electrophysiology, glutamate uncaging, and pharmacogenetics. And that is one way of starting to understand this diversity of cell types in the retina by looking closely at one individual cell type and going through each of them like that. But during my first postdoc position, I just I switched to taking a population approach to understanding cell type diversity in the retina, using imaging tools to functionally classify many cell types at once. And so you can see here these ganglion cells that have been now color coded by their uh, responses to how they respond to visual stimuli. And this large scale approach is helping us to crack open the puzzle of how, of how some of the hardest to study cell types in the retina, the interneurons, work. And that's what I'm going to be telling you about today. So first, I want to apply this large scale approach to addressing a major outstanding question about motion processing in the retina. Motion is an essential feature of the visual world and animals use this for navigation, predator avoidance, detecting prey, all kinds of things. It's probably difficult to see the insect in this photo or in this video until I start the video and you can see that it's moving. So the retina re represents many different types of motion information at the level of the ganglion cells, the output of the retina. For example, the direction of movement in the environment, whether an object is moving differentially to the background, and whether an object is moving towards or receding away from the observer. And one of the major inputs and main excitatory input to ganglion cells, the bipolar cells, have not been found to transmit motion information. At the same time, there are 14 different types of bipolar cells in the mouse retina, and we don't really know why there have to be so many types. As you can see here, some of these types have axons that co-stratify with one another, suggesting that they're performing different functions from one another that could be combined in interesting ways um, in, the, in their inputs to the downstream cells. And so our question was, do some bipolar cell types transmit motion information? Okay, so together with two PhD students in Tübingen, Sarah Strauss and Marie Korampidu, we set out to look at bipolar cell motion processing and to look at it with this large scale approach where we examine all of the bipolar cell types activity at once. We remove the retina from the eye and place it in a perfusion chamber. And to measure the activity of the bipolar cells, we express a glutamate sensor called a glue sniffer that dynamically captures their activity. We image this with two photon microscopy, and at the same time to activate the visual responses in the retina, we project light onto the photoreceptors. This is what a movie of bipolar cell activity to two motion stimuli looks like. These are the stimuli here, it's a moving bar going in two directions. And you can see that the glutamate activity is waving across the screen, either to the right or to the left following that stimulus. And what's in here is uh, hundreds of bipolar cell axon terminals that are all probably about a pixel big. Um, but we can zoom in a little bit and use this pro approach to collect responses of thousands of bipolar cell axon terminals and see how they respond to motion and characterize their receptive field properties. So I'm gonna switch, skip right to the conclusions of this and tell you that based on the responses we got, we found that some bipolar cells respond the same if a motion stimulus starts near them, so starting kind of near where the cell is positioned here, versus starting far away from them, so motion that comes into their receptive field. On the other hand, oh sorry, we call these motion insensitive cells. On the other hand, we uncovered that other bipolar cells have actually a strong preference for stimuli that start near them and move away, um, compared to when an object moves towards them um, from far away. In other words, they have this radial direction selectivity, and we call these motion sensitive. 
So this means that certain bipolar cell types are capable of tracking the trajectory of emotion stimulus. They know if it started near them or not near them. And we've used modeling to put together combinations of bipolar cells and show that these different combinations of bipolar cells can do computations to detect stimuli of these different kinds that I mentioned earlier. And excitingly, we find that there are motion sensitive and motion insensitive types in each of these sub layers of the retina. And that means that they can be combined by uh, kind of shared postsynaptic uh, partners into all of these interesting different ways. And this has really opened up new possibilities for how ganglion cells perform motion computations. And it suggests that the motion versus non-motion bipolar cell types are likely influencing a broad array of downstream circuits. Okay, so now I wanna switch gears and tell you a little bit about our ongoing work to try to understand color processing in another cell type in the retina, the amacrine cells. So mice are dichromats with green and UV cones. And this is their spectral sensitivity shown here. And mice can use this chromatic information for vision and behavior. And we became interested in studying color in amacrine cells in particular because of these beautiful findings from my collaborator, Katrin Fonka's group. She recorded the color preferences of cells from photoreceptors to bipolar cells to ganglion cells, um, which is the excitatory pathway through the retina. And in her retinal recordings in the different areas of the retina, you can see one important feature of the mouse here, which is that it has a gradient of opsin expression from the dorsal to the ventral retina with more green opsin in the dorsal retina and more UV opsin in the ventral retina. And this pattern of color preference is maintained at the level of the bipolar cells. But when we get to the ganglion cells, the output of the retina, something curious happens. The color preference becomes more salt and pepper. And we were curious about the origin of this divergence of color information. And the inhibitory amacrine cells seem like the likely culprit to play a role in this processing because they're modulating the activity uh, between the bipolar cells and ganglion cells. So amacrine cells are a really big group of inhibitory interneurons in the retina, and they're also kind of the final frontier of the retina. And that's because they're really hard to study. This is because they have some atypical features. Um, most types lack axons and don't fire action potentials. They receive inputs and same outputs from the same processes, which I'm calling dendrites here. So dendrites are doing computations independently, like the starburst amacrine cell that has four quadrants of dendrites that are um, getting separate inputs and sending separate outputs from one another. Um, they are involved in feed forward, feed back, lateral and electrical signaling. And they're an estimated 63 distinct uh, types based on transcriptomics. And what this all means is that we can't record from amacrine cell somas and get all of the relevant information about the roles they play in vision. We need to record from their dendrites. So what PhD student Marie Lee Corumpidu and I decided to do was to express calcium indicators densely in GABAergic amacrine cells, which covers around 40 types. We then used the same two photon imaging and visual stimulation setup to record activity of amacrine cell dendrites. Here I'm showing a view of this calcium imaging in amacrine cell dendrites throughout the inner plexiform layer, the IPL, and we're playing a spot stimulus that flashes on and off and then modulates its luminance. And you can probably, or maybe you can see that the on and off sub layers are responding in an opposite manner to some of these uh, stim parts of these stimulus. And right, so these are these dendrites res responding to this stimulus and they're all tangled up together. So we get regions of interest using correlation methods. And then we can see how individual amacrine cell processes respond to this stimulus, which is achromatic, and then also to color noise. Um, and that allows us to characterize their color preferences. And so we did this for over 4,000 regions of interest from 17 mice so far. Um, and this is what the data that Sara and Marie Lee and I got looks like. There's a huge amount of information here and we're using modeling approaches to get a handle on how these different receptive field types are plugging into the rest of the circuit. But in general, I found that there are 17 clusters of amacrine cell processes. 
And these are responding in distinct manners to these stimuli that we've played to them. And these color preferences are much less correlated with one another um, with these kind of more in, uh, saturated values near zero, which is low correlation, than bipolar cells are with one another. And this point, and so at this point, it's clear that color information is diverging at the level of amacrine cells. And this likely underlies what we observe at the level of those downstream ganglion cells in terms of that salt and pepper pattern. Okay. So finally, I'd like to take a minute to talk about where I want to take these approaches that I showed you today. So in my own lab, I will continue to investigate bipolar cells and amacrine cells in their circuits. And in particular, I'm very interested in how these interneurons are tuned for their distinct functions that I've shown you today. And I'm excited to use tools like pharmacogenetics and modeling to knock out different circuit players and explore those mechanisms. In addition, at Tiffany Schmidt's lab at Northwestern, I've joined an emerging field of researchers looking at the role of peripheral sensation in neurodevelopmental disorders like autism spectrum disorder. So we know that neural circuits are performing atypically in several genetic forms of autism, and there are several lines of evidence that this includes neural circuits in the retina. And that may have deep consequences for development and function of the visual system and behavior. And this is work that I'm doing with two talented undergraduates, Ani Wickman and Pedro Guzman, as well as a really stellar technician, Maria Saida, and in collaboration with Greg Schwartz's lab, which is also at Northwestern. And in my research on uh, in go, getting, uh, cracking this uh, problem open, I'm assessing activity in populations of retinal interneurons all at once, like I showed you today. We're also looking at single cells to understand their physiology and anatomy, like I did during my PhD work. And finally, we're linking what we observe in the retina to behavior by assessing a broad range of innate behavior, innate visual behaviors. And that's what I'm developing right now in the Schmidt lab. And these behaviors include things like circadian behavior, pupil reflexes, and light hypersensitivity. Okay, so to conclude, I'm really curious about how the retina works in cases where nature has tweaked the circumstances, whether that's uh, within single cell types, between cell types, in the context of neurodiversity and disease, um, in uh, for behavior, and hopefully in the future between species. And that will be the fundamental question of my lab. And so with that, I'd like to thank all of the people involved in this work in the Euler lab, the Barron's lab, the Schmidt lab, as well as my uh, collaborators over the years, the many other lab members that I didn't have room for on this slide, my funding sources, um, as well as you for the, your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, that was wonderful. We are uh, have time for a couple of questions, so you can post it on the chat or just raise your hand. Anna, if you want to just um, close the screen, it's, it's a little easier yes. to see. Yes, we have a question from Madine. I'm hope, I hope I'm pronouncing it yeah. correctly. You can ask. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Anna. Great talk. Um, Hi, I'm nice wondering. Hi, I'm wondering if you can tell me a little more about the combined 2P and visual stem? Yeah, so are you, you're, so two photon uh, imaging uses far red light, so into the infrared um, to do the imaging. And this uh, light can still activate photoreceptors in animals. Right. Um, it's at, very much at the tail of the, of the ability to activate the photoreceptors, but it definitely causes responses and we can see those. And so for instance, anytime I start an imaging field, I often wait about 20 seconds for the retina to stop responding uh, to the scanning before I start to play my visual stimuli. But it's an ongoing problem and it's definitely a limitation of this approach, which is why I really like to combine it with electrophysiology where I can do, have no other stimulus oh, yeah. but my visual stimulus uh, looking at single cells. But it's also very powerful because we can get a lot more information from far fewer animals when we do it 
this way. Yeah, that's a really cool challenge. Um, and the visual stem is coming from the bottom or at the top? You can do it either way. I've worked on microscopes that set that up either way. And, and there are some different uh, technical details of, of okay. setting those up uh, in each way. Um, when it's from the bottom, you can make the field of stimulation bigger than what your objective uh, mm -hmm. field of view is, for instance. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And thank you, Anna, for that lovely talk. For the interest of time, I think we'll move to the next speaker. And so next we hear from Dr. Supraja Vardharajan. And we go from understanding the eye to one step into the brain in understanding intriguing mechanisms of neuronal connectivity. Supraja did her PhD in UCLA and then is doing a postdoc at Stanford University. She has received the Knights Templar Eye Foundation Fellowship and is also looking forward to being on the job market this year. So without any further delay, all yours, Supraja. Thanks, Mohini. Let me do a slide and sound check. Can you guys see my screen and hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you for the introduction. And I'd like to start by thanking the Leading Edge community for their support and for this wonderful opportunity to share my work on visual circuit regeneration. So uh, neural circuits are formed when axons navigate long distances to reach their synaptic partners. Now, if we were to travel from Los Angeles to New York, then we'd receive directional cues from our maps that give us some indication as to which turns to take, which ones to avoid, some intermediate pit stops until we reach our destination. Now, axons navigate their paths in a similar fashion, except they receive molecular cues called guidance cues from their environment. So this neuron here receives a combination of repulsive and attractive signals that shapes the axon's trajectory till it reaches its target. And the precision with which these axons navigate their path ultimately decides whether they connect with the correct synaptic partner or not, which in turn determines an organism's ability to perform day-to-day -day functions such as locomotion, hearing, speech, and vision. So understanding and identifying these fundamental principles that form neural circuits during development is really crucial to rebuilding those damaged neural circuits and restoring those functions. For my graduate work, I studied axon guidance in the developing spinal cord, and I redefined the role of a prototypical axon guidance cue, Netrin 1. I showed that Netrin 1 specifies sequential short-range cues that shape spinal axon trajectories during development. And if these uh, cues were missing or presented out of order, then these axons grew astray and did not reach their target. I then wanted to apply these principles towards regeneration, and I was particularly fascinated by the visual system, in part because we use it for a variety of functions and it's a critical sense we use to navigate the world and survive. Uh, but also in part, as Anna explained, it, the visual system is a very elegant model system in which to study axon growth, apply genetic and molecular manipulations and assess specific functional outcomes. So here's a schematic of the mouse visual system and I'll pick up where Anna's talk ended and focus on the eye to brain pathway. So this is the retina with the retinal ganglion cells or the RGCs. These RGCs send long projecting axons that ascend into the brain where they form synapses with several postsynaptic visual targets. to the brain through this pathway. That is, these RGCs send the information to the postsynaptic targets for further processing. So when an injury or disease affects the visual system, these axons disconnect from their targets, so they no longer relay information. They degenerate, the cells die, and then that leads to vision loss. Now, because these RGCs are part of the mammalian central nervous system, these axons fail to regenerate. And one successful strategy that the field has used is to reapply fundamental principles that form visual circuits during development to regenerating those same circuits. And many groups have identified key mechanisms that uh, form visual circuits during development, which include transcription factors, growth promoters, guidance cues, and neural activity. And many groups have done phenomenal work to reapply these mechanisms and manipulate them to promote regeneration of RGC axons following injury. 
Our lab has previously shown that increasing neural activity in the RGCs can promote regeneration of RGC axons following an optic nerve crush injury. However, one common unifying theme with all the approaches used thus far is that they're all looking at events occurring in the retina. But during development, though, these RGCs also receive signals from the postsynaptic visual targets. So as the RGCs ascend and approach these targets, they receive guidance cues, trophic factors, and other target-derived signals from these postsynaptic visual targets in the brain. And groups have shown that if you lesion these targets or deplete those target-derived signals, then that increases RGC death and leads to incorrect wiring. So these establish that these postsynaptic visual targets do play a crucial role during development. And yet we understand very little about what happens to these postsynaptic cells following injury. And so the main question that I focused on for my postdoctoral work was to elucidate the role of these postsynaptic targets in the brain in regeneration. I tested the hypothesis that target-derived signals from these visual targets can promote RGC axon regeneration. And to test this, I developed a distal axon injury model. And to tap into target-derived signals, I increased neural activity of these postsynaptic targets. So here is my experimental design that I'll walk you through. We can inject an anterograde tracer conjugated to a fluorophore into the eye, which then labels the RGCs and all their axons as shown here in green. These axons ascend as the optic tract in the brain, where they extend collaterals into two major targets, the LGN and the superior colliculus. And they also extend collaterals into several smaller targets in the pretectum, as shown in these white circles. So I developed an injury model uh, to sever the optic tract in the brain. And I then increase neural activity in the neurons in the pretectum using a chemogenetic approach. And by injecting a combination of fluorescent tracers into the eye uh, before and after injury, I then asked if increasing activity posterior to the lesion can promote regeneration of those injured axons. So here are sample micrographs from control animals that only receive an injury. The white dotted line indicates the lesion site. And here you can see in the pre-injury tracers, CTP labeled RGC axons the innervating pretectum targets. Here's a post-injury tracer, and I can process these images to identify regenerating axons. And because these are CNS axons in control in animals that receive an injury but no treatment, you see that there's very little regeneration going on. But when I increase neural activity posterior to the lesion, I now see a lot more regeneration in those groups. Quantification of this data shows that compared to controls, there's significantly higher regeneration in the activity group, and that these regenerating axons extend up to two millimeters past the lesion site within two weeks. Now, a good measure of regeneration is how well these regenerating axons reach their targets and uh, restore function. So I first assessed uh, the degree of regeneration within each of the targets shown here, and found that compared to controls, regenerating axons in the activity group reached both major targets as well as the minor targets in the pretectum. I then assayed the optomotor response, which gauges how well an animal can track a moving stimulus, which in this case would be these black and white bars that rotate around the mouse on a pedestal. And this work was done in collaboration with Fei Wang from Jean Duan's lab at UCSF. We found that while the distal injury causes a deficit in the optomotor response in control animals, this deficit appears to be rescued in the activity group. In other words, the mice that had increased activity were able to continue tracking the moving stimulus as well as they did before injury. So this data tells us that stimulating neurons posterior to the lesion promotes regeneration of RGC axons and rescues optomotor function. So this was a very exciting point in the project because now I had an established paradigm with which to tap into postsynaptic activity and then promote regeneration. So I then wanted to use this paradigm to ask a more specific question. What I've shown you so far is that I'm increasing activity in the neurons in the pretectum. This includes neurons that receive RGC input, that is the retinal recipient cells, uh, postsynaptic cells to RGC axons, but it also includes other neurons in the vicinity that do not receive RGC input. So to get at the exact contribution of retinal recipient cells to regeneration, I focused on one particular subcortical visual target, the nucleus of the optic tract or the NOT. And to selectively increase activity in the NOT, I used a genetic approach. And with the help of my colleague Onkar, identified a synaptotagment 17 Cree mouse line. I first characterized this mouse line to confirm that Cree cells are present only within the NOT, as shown here in the white dotted line, but not within any of the other subcortical visual targets. 
I then used a retrograde tracing approach with the rabies virus to confirm that these Cree cells within the NOT receive monosynaptic inputs from the retina or from the RGCs. In other words, this mouse line labels bona fide retina recipient postsynaptic neurons in the NOT. So this was a pivotal point for me because now I had a tool to access bona fide postsynaptic retina recipient cells in a visual target. So I increased activity specifically within those retina recipient postsynaptic cells in the NOT. Now, in, in, here is the NOT outlined in white. In control animals, I think we've lost Supraya. Um, yes, I think there might, must have been a connection glitch. Yeah, yeah. she's back. Oh, there you go. Oh, sorry. Can you hear us now? Yeah, did I, uh, I didn't realize, yeah. was I frozen? Lost you. Should, I, should I go back or where did, I, where did you lose me? You can start from this slide, I think. The, uh, okay. All right, I'll circle back a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, but so now I basically had a tool with the synaptotagmin Cree mouse line where I could selectively increase activity within the postsynaptic retina recipient cells. Now here's the uh, NOT outlined in white. And in control animals, again, because these are CNS axons, there's very little regeneration going on without treatment. But when I increase neural activity in those postsynaptic retina recipient cells in the NOT, I now see significantly more regeneration in the activity group. And these regenerating axons extend up to one millimeter past the lesion site with the highest level of regeneration right around the region where I increase activity. And in data I don't have time to show you today, we find that increasing activity within this one visual target also promotes regeneration to surrounding visual targets. So this data tells us that retina recipient target activity is sufficient to promote regeneration of RGC axons. So to summarize, I've shown you that broadly increasing neural activity posterior to a lesion can promote RGC axon regeneration. And this speaks to the importance of neural activity in brain repair. I've also shown you that retina recipient neurons can be leveraged to promote regeneration, which speaks to the importance of postsynaptic neurons in circuit repair. And together, these uh, findings have important therapeutic implications for treating eye injuries, optic neuropathies, and blinding diseases like glaucoma. 70 million people worldwide suffer from glaucoma, and these data suggest that maybe tapping into those postsynaptic target-derived signals could be a way to uh, promote regeneration and restore connectivity in these conditions. And this concept of trapping into postsynaptic target-derived signals can also be broadly applied to other CNS injuries, such as spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, and stroke. In the future, in my own lab, I will investigate the role of postsynaptic cells and neuronal activity in vision restoration in three directions. First is to identify target selection and synapse formation following injury. So in other words, how well can regenerating axons reach their original targets and rest restore specific functions and the role of target-derived signals in that process? I'll also investigate molecular mechanisms underlying activity-induced regeneration using omics approaches to identify molecular candidates that can then be tested using loss or gain of function. And in the third direction, I'll investigate activity-induced changes in neuron glia interactions following injury and the contribution of those interactions towards degeneration and regeneration. And a long-term objective is to tie each of these directions to synergistically treat degenerative diseases like glaucoma and restore vision. With that, I'd like to thank everybody who's helped me get here today, especially my many mentors and the people who have contributed to my work, especially Ankar and Faye, who've helped me out at pivotal points. I'd like to thank our funding sources and the Leading Edge community, and thank you all for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Supraja. Do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, I think we have from Ubada. Would you like yeah. to go ahead and ask one? Yeah. Hi, Superja. Great talk. Um, so I just have, uh, I guess I have one technical question, which is uh, the synaptotagmin 17 look like labels a minority of cells in the NOT. And it's pretty cool that that's sufficient to still drive the, I mean, you're limited by the tool that you have, but it's still, it was sufficient to drive the regeneration. So that's really cool. 
Um, I'm just wondering if you, first of all, quantified like how many of the neurons there are set 17 positive? So the, the Cree line labels are about 150 cells per animal within the NOT. Um, but as far as how, how, what percentage of cells those are within the NOT, I don't know yet. And in part because we don't have very good markers to just identify any specific postsynaptic cells other than this one. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I don't have a good sense of what percentage of cells within the NOT are that, or uh, yeah, how many of them are susceptible. I mean, the good news is the regrowth is pretty robust. So that's really nice to see. And then just another quick question is, um, maybe it's hard to know with the CTB, but is, do you have any sense of um, these regenerated axons, if they're collaterals branching off of um, kind of neuroprotected already their axons versus degenerated ones? Is there a way to tell? Yeah, sorry, so you're asking whether, whether they are degenerated axons or if they're uh, new like For example, let's say some, some axons or let's say are more resilient. Mm -hmm. um, and so if they're more resilient, are they going off new collaterals that is kind of triggered by this activity or, or are these uh, previously degenerating ones that are now regrowing? Is there a way to tell? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think it's a, it's a very important point to distinguish whether they are. I we think lost we lost Rebecca again. again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So probably for the sake of time, we might switch to the next uh, speaker now. I'm sorry. So anyone who had a question for Supraja, you can probably reach her uh, via uh, the discussion, uh, direct message or email her. Um, all right, so our next speaker is Elise Savier. Uh, so Elise uh, did her PhD at the University of Strasbourg in France and uh, where she developed maps in the visual system. Uh, she did her postdoc at the University of Virginia in the United States, working on the physiology of the superior colliculus. And uh, so Elise uh, today is going to talk about uh, the contribution of the secondary visual pathway to vision. She earned a K99 and is opening her lab uh, at the University of Michigan in January 2023. So she's definitely a rising star in the field. And uh, without further ado, Elise, uh, I'll leave you the floor. So can you see my screen and hear me? Yep, oh, we yeah. can see you. And thank you. All good. So yeah, thank you for this introduction. And I would also like to uh, thank the Leading Edge for giving me an opportunity to share my work. And today I'm gonna to uh, show you some of my progress toward understanding the contribution of the secondary visual pathway to vision. So you've heard a bit about the retina and then how do you connect to this postsynaptic region? And I'm gonna to try to tell you a bit more about the physiology of this postsynaptic targets. So, so most of our sensory experience as human is driven by vision. And it is through this sense that we actually recognize our peer, communicate, navigate, but also respond quickly to upcoming threats. So now how do we gather this uh, information? Well, as Anna mentioned, everything starts in the retina. And after some processing, this information is sent to a first relay in the brain, uh, which is uh, a nucleus located inside the thalamus. And upon further processing, all of this information is sent to the cortex. And this set of connections constitute what we call the primary visual pathway. And this path has been uh, implicated in a bunch of uh, different phenomena, such as conscious vision. Uh, and it's also through cortical processing that we're able to form images, recognize object, and also uh, down the road, recognize spaces, for example. Interestingly, this is not the only target of the retina. And, um, a copy of this visual information is sent in parallel to another brain region, which will be the focus of my talk, which is the superior colliculus. Now, the superior colliculus is uh, mostly known for its implication in the generation of eye movement, and it can be divided in two parts, the visual layers and the deeper layer, which are multisensory and motor mostly. And for today's talk, I'll be focusing on the visual layer. These layers have also been implicated in orienting and defensive behavior. And what do I mean by that? If we take, for example, this figure, little guy in the snow, he probably has a lot going on in his mind, is looking for food, shelter, you know, those kind of things. When all of a sudden, 
this guy up here. Now, his immediate survival depends on his ability to detect this threat and respond to it as quickly as possible. The same also holds true for the owl. Uh, if the owl wants to survive, it needs to eat, which means it needs to be able to detect its prey and target it very accurately. Now, both of his behavior, which are uh, pretty different, uh, uh, pretty different, have been linked to the superior colliculus. And we can see here that this same structure can drive very different behavior depending on context and expectation. Now, uh, one of my research goal is to understand how visual information is integrated across structure and how other modalities such as internal state shape these responses. I've shown you in the introduction that visual information is processed in parallel in the brain. And interestingly, the same set of visual cue can have very different meaning based on context and expectation. And to this date, we have very little understanding on how early in the visual pathway this visual signal are integrated and modulated. So to attempt to answer this question, I've been investigating the visual layers of the superior colliculus. And as you can see here, they have uh, different morphologically and molecular defined cell types. I've been focusing uh, on the white field vertical cell for a variety of reasons. So these cells have a soma located at the most ventral portion of the visual layers, and they send this very like elaborated dendrite all the way up to the dorsal surface. An interesting aspect is that uh, we already know from the literature that these cells actually uh, integrate uh, visual information from at least two streams, from the retina and the primary visual cortex. The primary visual cortex has also been shown to be modulated by internal state and by locomotion. So taking all of these features into account, the white field vertical cells seem an ideal candidate to understand how visual information is integrated and potentially modulated by other cues and purely visual signals. So going forward with this, um, I've, the first goal for me was to try to characterize the response property and the potential modulation of the white field vertical cell in awake mice. So to characterize the, this response property, I've been using an imaging method, and I took advantage of a mouse line, which is called the NTSR1 cream mouse. So this mouse basically has a genetic access into exclusively the white field vertical cells. And because I want to use imaging, I need not to be able to look at these cells. So uh, everything starts with the surgery. However, the supercolliculus is located right under the transversitis, so which makes things a little bit tricky. But uh, we're able to express um, a calcium indicator in the structure. And due to the genetic trick of the mouse line, we can restrict that to the white field vertical cells. So why do we use calcium indicators? Well, it turns out that whenever a neurons uh, fire action potential, there is no rise in the calcium concentration. And with the calcium indicator, this is translated into a rise of fluorescence. So now how do I get that rise in fluorescence? Well, first of all, I have to be able to look at it. So I place a little window that gives me optical access to the superior colliculus. And then we place the mice under a two photon microscope. So the mouse are head fixed, and then we can monitor when they're running or when they're standing still. And then we can show them a visual stimulus on the screen, which we uh, place at the center of whatever we're recording. And now this is how these cells look under the microscope. So you can see here the somas of these different neurons. And then we're gonna look at, we're able to look at each soma individually, which gives us the response for each cell. And here I'm showing you two example traits. So we're monitoring the increase in fluorescence, which is an increase in the cell's activity. And here the shaded region is wherever we were presenting a visual stimuli. And you can see for the two example cells, there's a rays whenever something is shown on the monitor. Now, the next step was to understand what really drives a white field vertical cell. And from pre Previous studies, it seemed that it was not going to be that easy. So I used a series of different stimuli, which uh, each probe different aspects. So the first one, with degrading, for example, allows us to see if the cell prefers a movement that goes in a particular direction, for example. The second one, the flashing spot, allows us to understand which part of the visual field is the neuron interested in. The last two are more uh, behaviorally relevant. In with the looming, for example, we're mimicking something that is coming towards you. And for the moving spot, it's more like a bug detector, like some small thing that might be of interest if you want to capture it, for example. 
Now I've shown all of these stimulus to the white field vertical cells and characterized their responses. So here we're looking at the normalized response to the moving spots. So I was able to compare, you know, across trial, across animal and across cells. And what you can see overall is that despite this uh, uh, high distribution, the cell most uh, of the time preferred the moving spot. There's very little response to between grading and overall um, looming and then moving spot at the favorite stimuli which means that white field vertical cell prefer discrete moving objects. So now that we've figured out what is the cell's uh, preferred stimulus, we can use that to probe other aspects. And the next aspect was to understand is these cells could be modulated by something else than solely the visual stimulus. So now I'm showing the same stimulus again and again and again. And what I'm doing is that I'm separating the trial depending on if the animal is standing still or if the animal is running. And we're using running as a proxy for aerosol because whenever the mouse is running, their pupils are dilated and their, you know, uh, their heart rate is increased, so they're more aroused in general. And this has been also used by other labs for other brain regions. So we're comparing whenever the animal is standing still or whenever the animal is running. And what you can see here is that we're looking at the peak uh, Whenever the animal is running, we actually have an increase in the signal. Uh, and this is uh, consistent when we use a more quantitative approach. So here we're doing the ratio, uh, well, subtracting whenever the animal is standing still to whenever the animal is running, normalized by their sum. So this means that an index of zero means no change, minus one means we have a decrease when the animal is, uh, uh, is running, and plus one, we have uh, an increase. And for the entire population reported, we could see actually an increase in the signal intensity meaning that the white field vertical cell have integrating signal from uh, other modality than purely visual signal since they're modulated by running. Now, what are the sources of this signal? So this is uh, bringing us to the second aim, which was to determine the white field vertical cell inputs and the potential sources of modulation. Um, so uh, to do this, I've been using a, a viral tracing method, which is retrograde. So in a first step, um, I'm still using this mouse, which expresses a genetic tool exclusively in the white field vertical cell. So the first step is to make the cell permissive to a second vector, which is the rabies. rabies. And then we um, also make the cells able to, uh, to we, uh, we when give the ability to the cell to make the rabies jump on synapse. Um, and then what happens is that we add the rabies and then within they get picked up only by the one field cell and then they can only travel one synapse retrograde. And after a few days, all of the cells that connect into the white field cell will be expressing a red fluorescent protein. Um, I've told you in the introduction that we know that the white field cell receive input from the primary visual cortex and the retina, but what about other brain region? So first of all, uh, we could confirm this finding. So what you see here is a flat mounted retina. So what we do is we take the retina out and we uh, make a flat mounted. So it looks like this uh, clover kind of uh, can. And then you have like all the little dots that represent the soma. So we're a completely different scale. And at the bottom left, we have a picture of the visual cortex and you can see all the pyramidal cells that are nicely lined up here. So we're confirming other, uh, others finding, but we could also find other region which were not, um, as well described, and we found cells coming from the pretectum, the parvigeminal nucleus, and also the ventral LGN. So it seems that once the cells receive input from multiple brain region, which uh, could also integrate more signal than purely visual. Um, now that we've identified all these different targets, uh, uh, the goal then is to understand what is their contribution to the white field cell visual responses. And this would be achieved by selectively manipulating independently the different brain region and seeing if, for example, we stop seeing that modulation by locomotion. This brings me to the last aim, which is to characterize the white field vertical cell responses in tree shoes. So what are tree shoes and why tree shoes? Um, tree shoes are diurnal animals that are closely related to primate, which means that they have a high translational potential. If we understand what's happening in a tree shoe, we have a much higher chance of understanding what's happening in humans. And they also have a very similar visual system organization. Uh, they have a layered LGN, which you can't find in a mouse. Um, they have column and high level organization. So this brings us much closer to humans. But also they are diurnal, meaning that they have a cone dominated retina and they have a much better visual acuity and vision is one of their primary sense, similarly to us. 
And this allows us also to uh, conduct direct comparative study. The cell I'm interested in, the white field vertical cell, can actually be found across many species. And we can find a white field vertical cell in a mouse, in a shrew, but also in reptiles and, uh, and other species and birds. So uh, the major goal being to isolate these cells, uh, and this project is still in its infancy, but we're actually already able to uh, record, um, uh, do electrophysiology recording in vivo in an awake head fix um, tree shrew. And we're able to uh, isolate single unit, meaning that we can actually record the entire super, uh, population of cells that are located in visual layers of the supercuticulus. So that's the first step, but in the future, I would like to use um, optotagin. So uh, the white field vertical cell only target one specific brain region. So using this trick, we can actually isolate them from the rest. And then we would have the white field vertical cell responses in a tree shrew and in a mouse. And we can see if they have different level of modulation, do they prefer the same stimulus and so on. The long-term goal would be to have similar setup and freely moving uh, behavioral assay, but that's much further down the road. So to summarize, I've uh, uh, shown you that uh, the white field vertical cell are actually modulated by locomotion, suggesting that they're interested in more than just visual signal. Uh, they receive input from a variety of brain regions. Some of them were more unexpected. The next step would be to manipulate the activity in this different source of input and see how they shape the white field cell responses. And um, I would like to take most of this experiment into the tree shoe, which is much more closely related to humans and also uh, features many interesting uh, behaviors. And with this, I would like to thank my lab and uh, mostly JC, Huey who helped with all the code and Kara will help with a lot of the histology. Thank uh, all of my collaborators and my uh, funding sources and also advertise uh, the lab, which will be opening um, in uh, the University of Michigan in January 2023. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Elise, for this beautiful talk. Uh, do we have any question from the audience? Okay, not quite for now. So, oh, there, okay. Go for it, Madini. Hi, Elise. Hi, Elise. Great talk. Um, are there any specific behavioral um, differences between tree shrews and mice that you think might be relevant to the white field cells? Um, I mean, they're, they're um, probably are more driven for like prey capture behavior since they're insectivore, for example, and they're, you know, also um, arboreal. So they would have, you know, way more uh, element to compute with their visual env environment when they're jumping and so on. They do a lot of also head movement, which would require for additional compensation. So I think there's a lot more to discover in, in the shrews and in the mouse, for example. That makes sense, thanks. Okay, I guess we don't have any more questions. Uh, we don't have much time either, so I'd prefer to switch to the next speaker today, and our last speaker, Rose Hill. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have Rose Hill talking with us today. She did her PhD at UC Berkeley uh, on the molecular mechanisms of pain and itch uh, and the neuroimmune uh, interactions in chronic itch. Uh, she did then her postdoc uh, at Scripps um, to, on molecular and cellular mechanisms of mechanotransduction. And this, this is what she's going to be talking about us today. So she's definitely like, we're definitely quitting uh, the world of vision uh, to another sensory modality. Um, she earned uh, postdoctoral, sorry, fellowship, the Helen Hay Whitney. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm going to leave the floor to her right now. Rose, we can see her, your slides. So I think all is good. Take it away. Rose, are you still yeah, around? I'm don't here. See you, though. Yep, just unmuted. Can everyone see me and see my slides? I can see your slides and I can see you now. All good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Julie, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm excited to tell you all about my work uh, today on an unexpected role of mechanotransduction in itch sensation. So our somatosensory system, uh, which is you know very different from the visual system we've been hearing about earlier, 
imbues us with the ability to detect and discriminate touch, pain, temperature, and also itch. So the, the first point in this system are this diverse set of peripheral neurons that send axons into the skin and visceral organs where cues are detected. And so these cues can come from the external environment, like a hot stove or a hug from a friend, um, or they can come from endogenous processes, like the release of histamine from immune cells during an allergic reaction, which evokes itch. And in my graduate work at UC Berkeley with Diana Bautista, I focused on endogenous chemical cues from the skin and immune system that trigger the sensations of itch and pain. I then uh, became interested in better developing our understanding of sensation in general, and uh, then focused on how mechanical cues are sensed in my postdoctoral work. And so the work I will tell you about today mainly has to do with itch, which is medically known as pruritus. And so what is itch? Put bluntly, itch is the unpleasant sensation that causes the urge to scratch. So under normal conditions, itch can be a very beneficial sensation and warn us of a burrowing parasite or pest or let this cat know they have a flea they need to scratch away. Chronic itch, on the other hand, has no discernible benefit. And more than 10% of us, unfortunately, will experience this at some point in our lives. And the seriousness of chronic itch is reflected throughout history. For example, uh, in Dante's Inferno, the falsifiers and alchemists were said to be punished with the burning rage of fierce itching that nothing could relieve. And itch is sometimes used culturally as a form of punishment, as with the Ao people in Southeast Asia, who have used wood from the Masang Feng tree to make itchy jail cells for punishing petty criminals. And also some early Christians would wear hair shirts to cause constant itching and irritation so that they could reflect on their sins. And I like these examples because together they illustrate the two forms of itch, chemical and mechanical. And so an everyday example of chemical itch uh, would be, you know, a mosquito bite or allergic reaction that, as I said, causes release of histamine into the skin. Uh, and mechanical itch is best exemplified by, you know, the sensation of insects crawling on the skin uh, or a wool sweater. And the neurobiology of itch has been studied for nearly a century, although it receives less attention than pain or other modalities. But it was only in the last 15 years or so that any major progress was made towards understanding its molecular and cellular basis. And so what I'm showing you here are the several types of itch peripheral sensory neuron that have been identified. And these are called pruriceptors, and they express their own unique repertoire of ion channels like trip channels and sensory receptors such as GPCRs that transduce itchy stimuli into electrical signals. Um, and in my graduate work, I elucidated just a few of these chemical signaling pathways in these cells that lead to itching, uh, as well as understanding the crosstalk between itch and pain sensation. And as you can see here, there are a lot of diverse pathways we've identified. But what I want you to focus on is that all of these neurons are chemical itch receptors. And I mentioned before that there's also mechanical itch. And so I don't have a similarly detailed diagram for mechanical itch because uh, it was poorly understood. And so we know very little about the cells or the, the molecules, the transduction channels that are responsible for mechanical itch. And so um, the major question I wanted to uh, study that was this outstanding question in the field was, you know, what is the mechanical itch transducer, the ion channel, and what sensory neuron subtype or subtypes are required for mechanical itch? Um, and so I, I joined the Patapuchin lab more generally to study how cells sense and respond to mechanical forces, but then became interested in this very open question. And by answering this question, I hope I can show you how it leads to new areas I hope to explore in my independent lab. And so the Patapuchian lab studies piezoproteins, which are a class of non-selective cation channels that are gated not by voltage or by ligands, but by mechanical forces in the form of plasma membrane tension. And there are two piezos, piezo one and piezo two. And it's worth noting that these piezos are absolutely enormous proteins uh, that reside in a specialized bending of the plasma membrane, these so-called piezodomes. And the channels open uh, in direct response to membrane stretching, um, which results in an increased channel area and flattening of this dome. 
And these piezoion channels uh, play important roles in many physiological processes, including obvious ones like touch sensation and breathing, but also more subtle processes like digestion, cardiovascular function, and bone growth. But whether and how these piezos contribute to mechanical itch in somatosensory neurons was unknown. And so uh, I began by examining potential candidate genes that might be involved in mechanical itch. So I looked at the expression of piezos and other mechanotransducers in the somatosensory ganglia and the primary sensory neurons. And this led me to a surprising finding. So I performed single molecule and C2 hybridization to look at the expression of piezo genes in sensory neurons. And I found that a subtype of chemical proreceptor, uh, shown here in green with these white arrows, robustly expressed piezo-1, uh, shown here in magenta, and expressed only low levels of piezo-2, which I haven't shown. Um, and this was interesting, as previously piezo-2 was thought to be the primary mechanotransduction channel in the sensory neurons, and the role of piezo-1 was not explored. And it was also interesting that these proreceptors even express a mechanotransduction gene, because they've been previously thought of as chemosensory neurons that are mechanically insensitive. Um, and so I show here these proreceptors were marked by this NPPB gene that encodes a peptide, but they are also marked by somatostatin. And this expression of somatostatin made them amenable to uh, genetic targeting with a somatostatin Cree mouse that both allowed me to label these cells um, and study them in my later experiments. And so um, because these cells were thought to only mediate chemical itch, um, it was thought they didn't respond to mechanical stimuli. And so I set out to test this directly. And so uh, we can test the ability of cells to respond to mechanical force by uh, indenting the membrane in a controlled manner with a blunt glass probe while simultaneously recording mechanically activated currents using whole cell electrophysiology. And so using this somatostatin reporter mouse, I was able to record from labeled primary itch neurons in culture, which expressed TD tomato. And what I found was actually that the majority of these so-called chemical proreceptors were mechanically insensitive. And so the trace here shows the microns indented by the poker um, with the below trace showing the inward current elicited uh, by those steps. And so we found that the majority of these cells had this uh, characteristic pattern of inward currents that were stimulus intensity dependent, had a rapid inactivation and subsequent inactivation. And this is characteristic of mechanosensitive ion channels like piezos. But what ion channel was responsible for these currents and was it piezo one? And so um, to examine that, I nucleo affected small interfering uh, RNAs into these cells. And I found that you know on the right was knocked down of piezo one, um, there was robust attenuation of the mechanically activated currents in the labeled cells. And so these remaining little blips on the trace are actually just electrical artifacts from the, the poker itself that moves. And um, the results are quantified here with, um, as you can see in the control conditions, the colored boxes show that the vast majority of the cells respond to the poking stimulus. But after knockdown, uh, only around 25% of these cells are still mechanosensitive. And so this showed that, you know, <clears throat> piezo-1 was responsible for mechanically activated currents in these itch neurons. But what about itch behaviors? Do mice lacking piezo-1 in these cells uh, still have mechanically evoked itch? And so I was able to use the same somatostatin Cree mouse uh, to uh, generate a piezo-1 conditional knockout mouse lacking the channel in these itch receptors. And we can study mechanical itch in mice by gently stimulating uh, the back of the neck or the nape of the neck with calibrated filaments that deliver a set force. Uh, we can then quantify the proportion of trials where the mouse scratches in response to being poked at the given force in grams. And so that uh, gives us these plots like these where it shows the um, number of trials the mice scratch at a given force. Um, and what I found was that um, while control mice scratch robustly to a range of forces, um, the piezo-1 conditional knockout mice failed to have the same robust itch behaviors. And even when I pre-sensitized the mice to mechanical itch using a chemical itch compound histamine, um, I also observed that the conditional mutant mice uh, did not display uh, mechanical itch behaviors uh, in response to the pre-sensitization. 
And so these experiments demonstrated for the first time uh, a mechanotransduction channel in itch neurons, chemical itch neurons, uh, that underlies mechanical itch. And so to take it one step further, I wanted to understand whether my findings were relevant in the context of chronic itch, which I stated earlier is a major global health problem. So chronic itch patients often complain about certain fabrics or clothing being too itchy to wear. And this is attributed to them having mechanical itch sensitization. And uh, I next wanted to test whether piezo one was responsible for this phenomenon using mouse models. So I adapted a chronic itch model of eczema I'd used in my PhD work. Uh, so topical treatment with this compound MC903 causes inflammatory changes in the mouse skin that closely mimic human eczema. So you can see in this photo, the mouse's skin is very scabby and scaly, resulting in robust itching. So I then tested uh, piezo one conditional mutant mice lacking the channel and sensory neurons. Um, and I found that they lack this mechanical itch hypersensitivity. Um, similar to the histamine model. Um, however, they still developed severe skin lesions that were consistent with the chronic itch state. And so this showed that we can separate the mechanical itch from the inflammation in skin pathology and suggest that PISA-1 might be a relevant target for the treatment of chronic itch hypersensitivity. And so um, taken together, uh, these findings lead us to this model of mechanical itch um, and were also recently published just last month. And so I show that these chemical itch receptors are polymodal and that they also sense mechanical stimuli in addition to their well-known role in sensing chemical stimuli. And so this suggests that these neurons might be important for integrating a variety of noxious or aversive cues during acute and chronic itch states. In addition, I've also demonstrated an important role of piezo one in sensory neurons, which has since been overlooked due to the very important and obvious roles of piezo two in light touch sensation and balance. And so in the future, I want to combine my PhD work on neuroimmune interactions and my current work on these itch neurons. I plan to use the tools I've developed here in my future lab to understand potential internal or interoceptive roles of itch neurons. Um, we're beginning a collaboration with the E-Lab at Scripps who pioneered whole mouse clearing techniques for the study of peripheral innervation. Um, and we're hoping to look at the internal innervation of itch neurons. And so while it's thought that itching is only experienced by the mucous membranes and the skin, these neurons might be playing important roles in integrating immune, chemical, and mechanical cues in internal processes and in inflammatory states. And so using viral strategies uh, I'm currently developing to target these cells, I hope to test the function of these neurons in models of chronic inflammation. And so this um, is an extension of previous work I've done in, in graduate school on the studies of skin innervating neurons in chronic itch. And so previously, I identified a molecular and cellular axis linking the innate immune cell neutrophils um, to sensory neurons during the development of chronic itch. And so I plan to unravel the contribution of specific subtypes of neurons to inflammation and identify novel ways of how they communicate with the immune system and other cell types. And so lastly, to conclude, I just wanna thank everyone I've worked with in the Patapuchian lab, um, especially my co-authors, um, Adrian Dubin and Megan Loud, um, and everyone at Scripps for their support, as well as my funding sources and the amazing Leading Edge organization um, for putting together this wonderful program and speaking opportunity. Um, so thank you, and now I'll take uh, your questions. Thank you, Rose, for this great talk. Do we have any questions in the audience? No question yet for Rose. Amohini has a question. Hi, Rose. Go. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. So my question was, I wanted to know a little bit about systems level organization of these neurons. So what percentage of these SST neurons uh, make up the whole each sensitive neuron? So do you think there are, how many are multimodal versus only sensitive to uh, chemical cues versus mechanical, et cetera? Yeah. yeah, and so at least from the electrophysiology recordings, we observed that around 75% um, of these cells were mechanosensitive in culture. 
And so there may be some heterogeneity within these populations, although that doesn't really come out in the single cell RNA seq studies that other groups have done. Um, but then with regards to itch neurons as a whole, there are distinct other um, subtypes of itch neurons. Um, and they're really only similar in the sense that they all evoke scratching behavior when they're activated, either chemogenetically or optogenetically. But it's very interesting. Um, so this subset expresses a broad range of receptors for cytokines, interleukins, and other immune molecules, but some of the other populations do not. And so that's why I think these cells might be poised to integrate various stimuli. And with regards to sort of the central mechanisms, I think with the mechanical itch pathway, a lot of that is not known yet, but the chemical itch pathways have been um, well established in the spinal cord and more recently uh, beyond in the brain. Well, thank you, Rose. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, for coming today. Uh, thanks our presenter, um, uh, Anna, Supraja, Elise, and Rose for presenting today. Those really beautiful talks. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, remember that next week will be our last week of Leading Edge Talks. So don't forget to tune in on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And don't forget also that Clarissa will finally present on Wednesday. She is added to Wednesday uh, to the Wednesday series. So if you want to talk, if you want to hear more about somatosensation, sensation, please also tune in uh, on Wednesday. Thank you and bye.